Well, welcome everybody to our first Mobility Mentoring Direct Service Staff webinar for this year. Um, with, I hope that you all are having a great afternoon and that it is very sunny and beautiful wherever you're at today in the state of Washington. It certainly is here in Bellevue today. Um, we're going to get started and uh, as always, we like to record these uh, webinars. So uh, we just want to do a few welcomes and introductions today. On the phone from the Department of Early Learning is Karen Gans, the Program Collaboration and Operations Manager. Myself, Carrie Beamer, uh, Pre-K Specialist with the ECAP team, and also Je Jeff Robertson. Uh, he's a Pre-K Specialist on the ECAP team as well. And then we're really, really fortunate to have uh, Deanna, uh, I think it's Rochi, and Emerald, oh, I should have asked you guys how to pronounce your last names. I asked your first name, but not your last name. Uh, Cogren. Uh, so I just want to say a little bit about these two, uh, the folks from Empath that are on the phone with us. Just to give you some background about uh, what Emerald and Deanna do for Empath. So uh, Emerald has uh, began her career in social work. Um, she, as a dropout prevention case management and licensed social worker with communities and schools outside of Houston, Texas. She returned to school to earn her master's degree in social policy and evaluation from the University of Michigan. And while in Michigan, she worked in outreach and programming at Jewish Family Services of Washtakna, Washtakna County and led an evaluation grant funded Youth Leadership Council at Kyrgyz Center uh, Program Evaluation Group. And now Emerald works as a senior associate for Empath Economic Mobility Exchange, supporting the exchange members, facilitating trainings, Managing, managing the development of internal and external train the trainer curriculum. So welcome, Emerald. And then Deanna is with us, and she is a skilled facilitator and trainer with experience developing capacity and the training the trainer curricula. She also specializes in creating and managing culturally competent mentoring programs. Deanna was a member of the team that introduced mobility mentoring to Empath eight years ago. She is a strong advocate for children and families with disabilities and knowledge in special education law. Diana uses multidisciplinary and strength-based approaches when coaching families. So we want to welcome the two of them today. Here's a little bit about what we will do. We're going to give you folks out in the field a little bit of an update of what um, some of the data we collected over um, the last year. And then um, just a few updates to ELMS. And then we'll dive right into the presentation from Empath. So uh, many of you uh, probably know this, but I thought we should note a couple of changes that were done in ELMS, and I, I would also like to say um, that these a lot of these changes that we make in ELMS over the next year, which I do meet with the ELMS team quite regularly, um, come from the field, and they come from you uh, saying to us, I wish I had a report that could do this for me, or I wish I could um, hold this piece of information uh, from, the da from the data that we collected. So anytime uh, you can think of something that would make it more helpful for you all in the field, please let us know about it. Um, you can email me um, and just give me your suggestions. So uh, starting at the beginning of the year, you can uh, now assign the family support pilot role at a contractor level for anyone who should see that uh, family support pilot tab. 
Um, the other thing that you might have noticed already is you can print a Spanish version of the bridge. Um, and the link is right alongside the English version of the bridge. And now you can also view last year's family goals by child report by selecting the cumulative button um, as an option for that report. So I just wanted to um, sort of go over a little bit about our first year of um, data that we were able to collect. So we know that last year we had 2,585 families participated in mobility mentoring that received both a pre and a post assessment. So of those families that participated, uh, we had uh, a number of the, well, all, you know, all of them had goals, but some of them had even more than one goal. Uh, we calculated 3,203 family goals were set for the year, and that was about a 1.3 average um, per family. Of those goals that were set, 1,583 of these family goals were met during the year. And um, I also think during the evaluation process, we, all, we heard some really positive things from, from uh, families around mobility mentoring. And some of the feedback that we received is that families plan on continuing working on their goals even after they may have graduated from preschool. Uh, one parent said that after ECAP support this year, it was easier for her to slow down and think about our problems and get to a solution. And another parent also reported that she felt like she knew where to go for help and had people to talk to. So today is really revisiting um, what we had a webinar last year in May um, around writing SMART goals, but we really wanted to drill down more. Um, the folks uh, from Empath and us have talked um, several times, and we're, everyone's in agreement that um, yes, we talk a lot about SMART goal writing, but it is something that we need to revisit more and think about, you know, making it um, more actionable instead of the example that's on the screen is, you know, you want to save money versus, you know, a SMART goal is I want to save $300 in a specific amount of time. So the uh, uh, Diana and Deanna, sorry, and Emerald will be walking us through those SMART goal um, ideas today. One of the pieces of data that we collected during the year, uh, the top portion of this slide is uh, the darker blue colors um, are looking at pre and post, and then the far column is um, goals uh, or gains. Um, uh, that folks made within those goals. And then at the bottom, in the lighter blue colors um, are uh, also some, but you can see that the, there's a big difference between the two in that education attainment, legal issues, housing, earning levels during the year made very little gain. And versus school involvement and advocacy, community resources, healthy lifestyles made pretty significant gains on uh, their, their goals. And um, we had some thoughts and some ideas. We wanted to just share this slide with folks to get you thinking about why do you think that is? What, what are some of your thoughts around why these four uh, issues, uh, like education attainment, legal issues, housing, and earning levels didn't really seem to make that much progress versus the bottom three. So I'm going to pause for just a second if there's anybody that wants to raise your hand, wants to comment, wants 
left or right in the chat box or um, Karen if you have something to say or Deanna and Emerald. Just want to pause for a moment and let people think about this. All right, looks like we have some questions coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, some responses. And so it looks like Alejandra said uh, top four are more broad and also longer to obtain. Um, Chantel said, I think that the ones were harder to obtain because they would take longer to achieve, so very similar. And then Estelle also said top ones uh, more long term, uh, and that's from her team. Yeah, I would I would agree with all of those comments. Okay, uh, go ahead. Oh, hi, it's Emerald um, from Empath. Deanna and I were just yeah. at this, and it's just interesting that the um, those top ones two are very interconnected. As I mean, they're all interconnected, but I think those top three specifically might be really interconnected, and so it's harder to achieve um, maybe one goal in one of the legal issues or housing, and then um, harder just kind of across the board in those areas, and then kind of same. But in the, on the opposite end of it, maybe being um, a little easier to achieve those interconnected goals on the bottom. So I wonder if that's kind of that piece of it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then the other thought that we had, and we still need to dive a little bit deeper into the actual goals that are being set, um, is, the, is the goal that was set um, so large that so, for example, education attainment, what is the goal that was set, I will complete my BA, my bachelor's degree, right? And then um, there's steps involved in it, but during the time that we have participants with us, there would be, it would not be completed. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just wanted to get us sort of framed in where we were um, with our uh, SMART goal writing. And I know that we had a great meeting this morning with agency coordinators that have some great ideas on how to um, further this work um, with their direct service staff. But I think for right now we are going to, um, I'm going to hand it over to Deanna and Emerald. And I just need to say, change presenter. Carrie, while so, you're getting that set up, um, we did have another comment that came in and was it per, uh, Libby wanted to state that often legal issues are very expensive to resolve as well. It's mm, a great comment, yeah. So I did send it over to you. Oh, great. Did you, okay. yes. did you get anything? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one second. Let me... Okay. Okay. Did, can you see our screen? Uh, I can. Yeah. Great. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Carrie. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Emerald Cronin. As Carrie gave us a wonderful introduction, but I'll just kind of do a a reintroduction. Um, I work as part of the Economic Mobility Exchange here at Empath, so that's our learning network um, of which you are all a part of. Um, and so we're very excited to be here with you. Um, as Carrie mentioned, my colleague Deanna here with me, um, she's actually the former coordinator of our Career Family Opportunity Program or our CFO program, um, which we talk about a lot as where kind of a mobility mentoring was born. It was where it was first piloted. Um, so she's a great resource in kind of where, where it all began and how it's evolved. Um, and she also has experience working directly with participants and now training our frontline staff, um, so bringing kind of that experience as well. Um, as Carrie mentioned, I come from case management, kind of social work background, and also program evaluation, um, and now is working as part of the exchange team. Um, I love being able to support organizations like you that are learning about and implementing um, some form of mobility mentoring all around the country. Um, so we're very excited to be here, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Oh, there we are again. Oh, also, sorry, not, I hope that didn't make anyone nauseous, but this, um, 
Our contact information is also here, um, so any follow-up questions after the presentation link, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, all right. So today, Vianna and I are here to talk about writing smart and meaningful goals. Um, throughout the presentation, we're going to touch on other elements of mobility mentoring in the process. Um, as you likely know, they are all interconnected, and um, we will hopefully also provide a few tools and resources that might be helpful as you are goal setting with families. Um, but before we get started, I'd really like to note that this is how we think about the work here at Empath, um, but we do not write the book on goal setting. Um, you know your families and the population that you serve best. Um, and so we hope you take the information today and integrate it in a way that works for you. Um, we also encourage you to ask questions and we welcome comments and feedback um, as we go. So I think we'll be able to see the little, if something pops up, um, if someone asks a question, but please, uh, we welcome that. Right. So just a brief kind of overview of what, of what we're going to talk about today. There are a few different elements of goal setting that we hope to cover. Um, the first being what the actual goal setting process entails and why it's important as a part of mobility mentoring. Um, goal setting at its core is participant driven, but we like to delve a little deeper into how you as the mentor or the coach um, or case manager might work with the participant or family in setting goals that are meaningful within the time frame you're able to provide that support and also along with the contractual obligations um, your program is expected to adhere to because that's also another level of kind of this process of thinking about it um, in working with families. All right, and there's just a few items, again, that we hope to cover and questions that we hope to answer. I mean, if you have other questions, please shout them out. But so what are SMART goals? I know Carrie mentioned um, you probably all know what a SMART goal is, and it's something that you hear a lot. But um, here at Empath, we talk a lot about it. Uh, but I think it's coming in practice. Um, it can be harder than it sounds, right? So working with participants, there's a lot coming up. Um, families are often in crisis, um, so thinking about setting goals in that time and, and making them smart. That's, I mean, there's multiple layers to that process, and so I think the more we talk about it, the more we practice, um, obviously the better that, that we are at it. Um, so what are SMART goals, how to create those meaningful goals, um, and maintaining momentum. So in goal setting, that's, that's part of the process. It can be hard to continue setting goals and achieving them if you kind of feel that, that lack of momentum. And so how as we have, um, so we call our um, case managers or family advocates here mentors. Um, and then we call our the individuals that we work with participants, so just for jargon um, in context. But um, how can we maintain momentum when working with our participants? Um, and then this idea of what is meaningful to us as mentors um, versus what is meaningful to our participants, right? So they're probably different. Um, some days they might be the same. But kind of having that conversation with yourself, with your supervisor, and understanding that um, that is a, a boundary that may exist um, or that should exist and how to kind of navigate that. And then what does self-sufficiency mean to a participant um, versus you as a mentor or your program? So here at Empath, how we define economic self-sufficiency is that idea that an individual is able to support um, themselves and their family without government assistance. But we also understand that many of the organizations that we work with do not define economic self-sufficiency or self-sufficiency in that way, um, and that program outcomes look a little different. And so thinking about goal setting um, in that framework as well. And then we want to touch a little bit on motivational interviewing um, and the use of kind of ORs in goal setting because um, we'll talk about it a little later, but the essential elements of mobility mentoring are all interconnected in that as you're goal setting, you're coaching. Coaching is the framework. It's the way that we treat our participants, um, this idea that they are whole people, um, very capable, smart, um, and working with them in a way of having that kind of unconditional positive regard. Um, and that's woven into the motivational interviewing, um, which is kind of woven into the goal setting and those bridge conversations and kind of keeping that um, in context as well. All right. And again, like I said, any questions um, or if any technical difficulties, please let us know. All right. And so as I quickly mentioned earlier, these are kind of our four and as you probably know, but our four essential elements of mobility mentoring that kind of all work together um, as pieces. So I like to say um, in mobility mentoring, the bridge of self-sufficiency, um, goal setting, and incentives are, um, and the goal setting sheet are tools that we use um, when we're working with families, when we're working with individuals. And then the coach, coaching approach is really kind of an overall approach to the work. So we use it in our tools, we use it in our conversations, and we use it in the everyday. And this idea that mobility mentoring was formed as a way to improve um, those executive functioning skills, and this idea that research has shown that individuals who live um, in chronic stress 
uh, those executive functioning skills um, might, um, they may not have had the luxury of kind of using those executive functioning skills and practicing them. And so that mentor relationship, that safe space, is a space to practice those executive functioning skills. And goal setting specifically um, is a wonderful space to be able to practice those skills. And it can happen um, even short term, even short term programs or only seeing participants um, a few times a year. You can still practice those executive functioning skills um, in the mobility mentoring approach. All right. Now I'm going to hand it over. Um, Deanna and I are going to switch back and forth throughout the presentation, but she's going to talk a little bit about coaching um, before we get into the, the goal setting piece of it. Hello, everybody. This is Deanna, and I'm going to start talking about the coaching because it's a very important element when we do our bridge assessment and when we also do goal setting. As coaches, we remind participants of the path they want to be on, and there are a lot of things in life that pull them away from the ultimate goal. As coaches, we help to maintain that future orientation and remind participants about their motivation. With our coaching using the bridge and goal setting, we build executive functioning skills and feelings of self-efficacy. And research shows that, they, that the way these skills, motivations, and mindset are built up is through the back and forth interaction with others over time so we, as coaches, can really, over time, help participants um, increase their executive functioning skills. And I know that some of you meet with your participants maybe three times a year, maybe five times a year. But still, is is you really have time to really connect with them and to develop meaningful goals. So no matter how many times you meet with them, uh, I think you can really make a difference in their life using their coaching and using all the elements of mobility mentoring. So we talk about our coaching approach. When we do coaching, we also use the motivational interviewing to engage participants and guide the conversations that we're having. And motivational interview can help the participants toward future planning create motivation before discuss, discussing goals, and also it's helpful to refocus on goals after the escalation a participant in crisis. Motivational interview elicits change, and this is really, really important because this is what we want. We want to work with our participants with the bridge of self-sufficiency and through goal setting so they can change over time. When we do our coaching, uh, motivational interviewing, we use ORT. And I'm going to briefly talk about this because, again, the coaching is very, very important for you to support your participant, to elicit change, and to start having those conversations about motivation and about changing behavior. So the open and the questions are those that ask participants to give more than a yes or a no, or no, or two times last week as the answer. When you ask open-ended questions, your participants will think, pause, and reflect before giving you an answer. And an open-ended question also helps the participant to explore issues that are important, challenging, or concerning. And I encourage you as a mentor to be curious and to learn what is important to the participant. That way she will learn that you are interested in what she is saying and will share more. And also, it's good that you ask for follow-up questions because then you can continue the conversation. So an example that I can give you about open-ended questions when you're talking to your participants are what is exciting to you about reaching this goal? How does this fit with your long-term plans? What are other options? Again, with these questions, you are really eliciting uh, participants to think about the future, to problem solve, to really think more about other goals, to learn more about, to think more about other meaningful goals that they can work on. The next one is affirmations. 
Affirmations are about noticing and commenting on your participants' strengths, abilities, and capacities. Uh, it's really more specific about their behaviors. For instance, you can say, hmm, it seems like you're really good at math and science based on the grades that you got from college this semester. Or you can say, well, it is really clear to me that you are trying to, to change that behavior and using more um, meditation techniques. So again, this is really for you to affirm the participants' strengths and to really motivate them to keep moving forward uh, on what they're doing. The reflections. In, ref in reflecting listening, you can rephrase, paraphrase, and reflect, reflect on participants' words and emotions. For instance, you can say, uh, based on what the participant has said, obviously, you are considering going to college and you are, con and you are concerned about finding the appropriate after-school program for your daughter. So again, with this example, you are really uh, reflecting on what the participant just told you, and you are showing the participant that you're listening to what he is saying, which is really important for the participant uh, to really know that you're listening, that you're understanding what he or she is saying. Um, the summary, you take everything that your participant said and summarize it. For instance, you can start by saying, let's go over what we have talked about so far. You can also say, tell me if I have missed anything. This is an opportunity for the participant to tell you, well, you know what, that's not what I said. Or maybe the participant kind of said, yes, that's exactly what I said. And again, you continue that conversation after that. Great. And so that's just a little background on um, kind of the motivational interviewing piece of coaching that, again, happens throughout the goal setting process. Um, and as the goal setting process comes from the bridge to self-sufficiency or the assessment process um, that you do. And so here, your bridge of um, Department of Early Learning, um, the William Mentoring Project bridge, and kind of what this looks like in the sense that the bridge um, will help you learn about your participants' strengths and challenges, um, allows you to really get to know your participant, kind of where they are, their dreams, um, their goals, their struggles, challenges, um, and creating context for that working relationship. So really the foundation for goal setting. Um, and as you first are doing the bridge, um, you're highlighting the interconnection oftentimes during the assessment between pillars. And so that often happens organically. Um, this idea that as an individual is talking about one pillar, you know, it's kind of seeing it all, all on the page of, okay, well, you know, if I want to go back to school, if my goal is, is attaining a four-year degree, um, there are other pieces of my life that I'm really thinking about in order to, to achieve that. Um, and so kind of this might be a good space too to bring in that, um, that, that first piece of goal setting um, and identifying really those, those larger goals. So identifying what an individual, um, how they view economic self-sufficiency, um, and then also having a discussion about your, your program and really what um, your own theory of change and kind of the goals um, as a family moves through your program because those also exist. Um, all right, so now getting into goal setting. So as I said, goal setting really flows from the assessment or the bridge assessment or, and oftentimes programs have more than one assessment, but that bridge exists to really open up that conversation. Um, and as once it's been determined where your participant is on the bridge, um, it leads naturally into a conversation about where they want to go um, and how they're going to get there. So obviously working in the one pillar bridge, it, it's not done in isolation. So the pillars in all different areas of our lives are interconnected. Um, and this idea of being effective at goal setting, we're trying to consider the context of the entire bridge. Like I mentioned earlier, that example of going back to school um, or, for instance, planning for home ownership um, requires considering savings and debts and earnings, um, which might also uh, require where you are in your schooling. Um, do you have childcare in order to go to a first homeowner's class? 
And so there's a lot to consider. I and mean, there's a lot of smaller goals in that very large goal. And so thinking about um, kind of how do you get from that large goal to thinking about where, you know, where do we start in square one. Um, goal setting as a practice is an opportunity for the participant to build and exercise their skills in planning for the future. Um, following through, completing action steps, achieving goals, and reflecting on their challenges and successes. So it's kind of those executive functioning skills that we mentioned um, previously. And these are the skills that we want to support them in building um, for themselves and continuing to use um, when we as mentors are no, are no longer there, so independently in the future. And this is our goal setting process. Um, so here it looks cyclical. Um, and oftentimes it is cyclical, but not always. It doesn't always occur in kind of one right after the another, another um, in this way. It can go back, um, it can move forward and quicker, um, right? But this is kind of the standard process of how we do, do goal setting. Um, so coaching through this process. I'm just going to go through it briefly um, before Deanna goes into the, the tools kind of of um, setting those goals. And so the first is that assessment and, and tuning in. So the first is the, really the bridge assessment, looking at the bridge and reflecting on where the participant is, and having that conversation, um, identifying strengths and challenges and potential goals, um, and also identifying values. That's a great um, space to identify values, and we're going to talk a little bit more about how, how to do that, because sometimes that can be challenging um, with families. Because it's hard to just sometimes say, what is your goal? Well, you know, if you don't really have rapport or know much about your family, um, that might be a tough conversation to have initially. So the next piece of when you first do that assessment, um, the next piece would be identify, prioritize, um, or refine goals and action steps if you've already set, set one goal. So based on the bridge conversation and this tuning in, um, brainstorming a list of potential goals that would help you or help the participant get where they want to be. Um, so these can be those larger goals. So remembering there's no limitations. So anything is possible in, in this section of really thinking about what does a family or participant want to achieve. And then deciding which goals are highest priorities for the participant. So that can also be a little challenging. Um, so we talk a little more about, or Dean and I will talk a little bit more about um, values and how you identify those. Um, but starting really by setting short-term goals. So prioritizing, again, that's going to be participant-driven. Um, so what's most important to them? Um, and how can the mentor or coach support the participant in reaching those long-term goals by breaking them into the smaller ones? Um, so identifying action steps. So that would be, be the next the next piece of um, of when you're, you're starting that first goal setting process. But even before then, so even if you're setting the goal, the large goal, you've broken it down, um, you found the action steps. It's not you know you, the, the likely the family's not just going to walk out and like go and um, they're just totally ready to achieve that goal. I mean they likely are because they're strong and capable. Um, but this idea that you also are working with them to identify the supports and challenges next. Um, so thinking about those professional, um, personal supports, um, and then also the challenges, so kind of those roadblocks that are going to come up um, externally. And then as you're writing those action steps and thinking about them, developing strategies for how to use those supports um, to overcome those challenges. So that's, again, part of a conversation and that you're often having with families or participants about, okay, what's standing in the way and what am I going to do if that comes up? And then that last piece is just working on the goal. So that's a piece that comes that happens outside of the office or outside of um, your work with the family. Um, and, but then they will likely, hopefully, come back and work with you. And so that's then the next um, the next step is that piece to reflect. So what worked? Um, what was challenging? Uh, what didn't work? Um, and then you kind of start the process over again and, and assessing and tuning in because things change. Oftentimes if you meet um, every other month, a lot has happened in that time. And so assess, assessing and tuning in and using the bridge again um, might be a good idea. And then you would go from there. You might refine the goals and action steps um, if things have changed. Um, or really thinking about that momentum piece too uh, and making sure that you're building up those that kind of the momentum with participants as you support them. Um, so again, it looks cyclical. Um, as you're goal setting more, it, I think it can move back and forth, but this is kind of the broad, the broad piece um, that we do with goal setting. Um, and then I'm going to pass it over to Dion, who's going to talk a little bit more about the specific tools that we use to kind of break down those, the goals. So this is one of the tools that we use to work with our participants. So you have done the bridge, so you know where the participant is, and you have also um, want to start the goal setting, you talk to the participant about how all the pillars are interconnected and 
you, by talking to the participant, you know a little bit more about their values, their goals, their challenges. So now, we use these tools to help the participant brainstorm about what those big uh, long-term goals are. I know some of you uh, meet with your participants for a year, so we divided this in, in three months. So thinking about a year from now, 12 months, what the participant is going to be doing. So what we do is we, with the participant, we brainstorm, okay, what is your, based on the, on the bridge conversation, so what do you want to do first? What pillar do you want to start working on? So because remember, it all comes from them, so they can be involved in the process, so they can be engaged in the process, and they will be more likely to follow those goals when they decide how they want to start. So they want to start first, let's say, with the family stability pillar of the bridge. So what do you want to be doing 12 months from now? So let's say that they want to start, um, that they want their daughter to be in, in an after-school program. So what do they need to do on month seven and eight to be able to reach that goal? And then you ask them, what do you need to be doing on month four and six? and what do you want to be doing on month one and three. And again, using your coaching, using your motivational interview questions, you start getting all those answers from her. Now, for some participants, they don't like to start from month 10 to 12. They like to start from month one to three, and that's okay. It's just depending on what is easier for them. But again, this is a very helpful tool that we use with participants to start that brainstorming session about the long-term goals. I also understand that some of you uh, are able to work with participants for two years, which is great, because then you're going to have more time to work with them. So in this case, I would suggest that you start talking to them about what kind of goals they want to be writing uh, into what kind of, of goals they want to be reaching two years from now. So you sort of help them to, you write down the, the goals they want to be uh, working on in each pillar of the bridge, of your bridge, and then, okay, that's great. What do you want to be, what do you need to be doing on year one? And that way, you kind of start developing those goals. So year two, what do you need to be doing on year one? What do you need to be doing? Uh, six months, and then how do you start today? But I find that it's a very good process for participants to be engaged, for them to start thinking about long-term plans and how something that seems a little bit difficult to do may be challenging because it's two years from now, if you can start planning now, and then you can have like the whole two years to start writing small goals and action steps to start reaching out those long-term long goals. And again, this is this work with most participants. Uh, some participants don't find this helpful. They will tell you right away what kind of goals they want to be working on, and that's fine. Uh, this is more for participants that um, need some extra help thinking long-term goals. Now, I developed this thinking about somebody who wants to, who wants to get a, a BA. He want, uh, this, this participant wants to get a bachelor's degree. So when you, want, when you want to get a bachelor's degree, you have to remind the participant that all pillars are interconnected and that in order for them to reach that great goal, which is a long-term goal, Again, it depends on the participant. It could be two years, it could be three years, it could be four years, depending on the other circumstances. Uh, so this, for this one, is 12 months that you're working with this participant. So for the participant to be able to get her BA or BS, unfortunately, you won't be able to see that because you're only going to be working with this participant for a year. However, there is a lot of goals 
that you can write with her, and you will see how she can accomplish a lot of them. So one of the uh, pillars of the bridge that you need to consider when you want when you want, when you're supporting the participant on the process of getting a bachelor's degree, you need to make sure that she has secure child care for child. And here on right uh, on month one to three, she can work on that. So, but that also is a big goal: secure child care for children. That could be part of, that could be the goal. Now the action steps, there is a lot of action steps that the participant will need to follow in order to secure child care. So there is, she needs to, one action step could be um, to look into daycares and home cares near her home. So she has to decide first where she wants a home care or if she wants uh, a daycare center. So that's a big decision for a lot of participants. So that could be an action step. Then she will need to, out of three or four that she researches, then she will need to pick three. And out of those three, she's going to need to visit them. So again, this goal secure child care for children that could see is that could be something easy to do. It really has a lot of action steps. Again, you really need to decide whether it is a, a, a home care or daycare. You need to visit them. You need to see if your child could be um, registered into that place. Then you need to make sure that uh, it is a good child care. And then you need to register the child and do all the paperwork needed. Now, for for somebody, the secure child care and those action steps could be a goal. How, however, for somebody else, um, secure child care for children, the action step could be to just start visiting home cares and then start visiting child care so she can see the difference. What I'm trying to say is that every a participant is unique, and for what one participant could be easy, those three action steps. For somebody else, that one action step could be just a goal. So you know your participant better than than everybody, anybody else. So you really need to the coaching learn more about uh, what is what how she wants to reach that goal, and that really comes from her. You're there to support her with the, through coaching, you're there to support her on choosing what are the action steps that she needs. And she's the one who needs to tell you how to break a goal. Because you might see one goal that you say, oh yeah, she can break, she can reach that goal. But once she starts, once she starts writing the goals, she might need to, that action step might need to become another goal. I have a participant that um, she got sick and she couldn't complete uh, a semester and she really needed to just com uh, do the, the incomplete and it was the goal was that she needed to finish the incomplete and the action steps were that she needed to go to a museum and piece an, um, uh, pick a piece of art and write an article about that. And she was wrote, she wrote the goal, and she came to me for a meeting, and she didn't reach the goal, and she said she was too busy. She gave me a few reasons for why she didn't complete the goal, so we changed the date on the goal, and then she came back, and she still didn't reach the goal, and I was trying to figure out what was happening, so I asked her a lot of questions, and I learned that, that she needed more action steps to reach that goal, so I learned that she didn't know how to get to the museum. So then we have to write a goal about basically getting into the museum, uh, what bus she needed to take, what time was the bus coming, what she needed to take the bus. So again, um, sometimes you just have a goal and you need to change it because the participant needs more action steps. 
Okay, I'm going to go back to the initial um, thinking about this participant uh, getting a VA. So again, you need to secure child care. Uh, for education, you need to explore school and programs that best fit the needs and interests of that person, and that could be a goal. Now, that goal could take a lot of action steps because the participant, number one, needs to um, needs to see what kind of program she wants. Another action step is that she's going to have to visit those programs. Then she's going to have to choose the three ones that she really likes. Another goal is going to search for scholarships. And that is a big goal that could also take uh, uh, a lot of action steps. So again, it really depends on the participant how a goal, how how many, how a, how a goal could have three steps or how a goal could have five steps, and maybe one of those steps needs to be another goal. Um, but you will know that as you work with your participant. For instance, in this example that I have here, uh, on month on month four and six, uh, she registered for a school, and she maintained good student status in good standing. And then for the next, sorry, for the next month, uh, she completes semesters with good grades or better. Um, so for the completed semesters with good grades, you all that that could be a goal. But then the action steps are: you really need to attend every class. You really need to do your reading. You need to do well in your test. Maybe you need a tutor. So that will be another action step when the participant is struggling. Then she might need a tutor. Um, so those there is a lot of action steps. However, if the participant doesn't know how to get a tutor, so then you will have to write another goal for how to find a tutor that can help you with your history class, and then write the action steps. I hope that's clear. Um, yeah, Emerald. And I and just um, I think this is a great way to map out kind of what it looks like over time, and then also using these as um, kind of a springboard for practicing setting the SMART goal. So you'll notice these might not be in SMART goal format, but oh, yeah. these are. Mm -hmm. It's a good chance just for staff with one another to practice, like setting yeah. these, these as, or making them as SMART goals. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. These are not as SMART goals. These are sort of the brainstorming uh, sessions that you have with the participants. Yeah. Um, also thinking about uh, working towards your VA or BS, um, you also need to review your credit report. Uh, sometimes we, found, we find that participants have a student loans that they didn't remember or they didn't know about. Uh, so they go to register and then they cannot register because they have all this outstanding debt that they didn't know about. So what we know now is that before the when they you know when they talk about going back to school, which is great, then we talk about getting the credit report to make sure that they know what they have there, if they have anything. Um, another example that I have here for um, for a start career exploration for a bachelor program. So some of the goal action except is meet with an educational specialist to help with career exploration. Uh, research career one stop dot gov and choose three programs of, of interest. So those three were the action steps. Now for somebody else, the, that, that last action step, choose three programs of interest, that could be a whole goal because if uh, the participant doesn't know what kind of um, program she wants to get into, that will be uh, a whole goal. So uh, I think I'm repeating myself a lot, but just trying to say that 
for the participant, depending on the participant, uh, what could be easier for a participant to do uh, a goal um, for another participant that action step could become a goal too. Um, and here I have the tool that you can use with participants to, that you see can see every two months. Uh, and again, this is to just brainstorm with participants about uh, goals. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about participants that after doing the bridge, um, they still don't really know what they want to work on. Uh, and that happens often with our participants. They are not sure what they want to do with their lives. Uh, they, don't, they are having a hard time dreaming, thinking big, thinking that they can accomplish anything. So what we do is we have uh, vision boards, which is what you see there. You can just get a, um, a big board and see stores, magazines, and they will uh, just use that to sort of have some motivation to think about what they can be doing two years from now, six months from now. Sometimes that doesn't work for people, so we do some visualization exercise, and I work for some of my participants. Um, I ask them to, you know, close your eyes and think about the well-being pillar of the bridge, and I start asking them questions about how do they, you know, how how are they taking care of themselves. Uh, for the financial management of the bridge, I said, okay, you have a lot of money in your savings account. How much money do you have in your savings account? So they kind of start thinking big, uh, thinking big and visualizing that they can accomplish something. Uh, for other people, what I do is ask them to write. Uh, for people that don't want to do, oh, don't want to think about vision boards or visualizing, then I. I ask them to do writing exercises. Again, think about what you want to be doing two years from now in your job. What kind of job do you want to have? And that helps a lot with people that are not able to, to think about what they want to do. Um, if anybody has any questions. Um, something else that it helps a lot as you do your goal setting and as you think about your action steps and how to keep your participants motivated and engaged is to know their core values uh, because that will help you in the long term when they're having challenges uh, keeping the momentum, keeping motivated uh, when they are in crisis. Uh, it's really important that you as a coach know what their core values are. And by that, I mean um, to ask the participants, for instance, to make a list of 15 things that are important to them, like religion, education, children, free thinking, anything that is important to them. You can ask them to write those down, like write 15 things that are important to them, and ask them to read them. And after that, ask them to cross out five of them and ask them to read it again. And then uh, after that, ask them to cross out five more. So at the end, they should have a list of their five most important values. And you want to know those because they're going to guide you on challenging times. As you know, that sometimes it happens. Um, when the participants are not motivated or when they lost interest in what they're doing. So it's really good to use those to keep, motiv to keep them motivated. And the last piece that I want to talk about, the goal, um, talking about motivation, is to talk about how sometimes participants are in crisis and how you can help them through those crises. Because if they come to you and you are ready, you have your agenda set to write goals so they can move forward on their bridge and they're in crisis, it's really difficult 
um, to have a conversation about goal setting when a participant is in crisis. And as you know, due to the nature of trauma and poverty, the majority of our participants live in stress and sometimes in crisis. And sometimes their minds are occupied by, occupied by daily crisis, so there is no much time to think about goal development. But as coaches, we need to help our participants maintain a focus on goal attainment. And that's why we have here the green edge of the wage, because you remind us that the more time participants spend in crisis, the less time they have for reaching their goals. And our goals as coaches is to help participants to to really start thinking about goal setting and to obtain goals so there will be less time for crisis. Uh, the more time you focus on crisis, the less time you have to focus on moving forward. And it doesn't mean it skills to be in crisis. In fact, it keeps relationships in problem solving mode. So your role is to take advantage of the crisis, to coach the participant, to solve the problem himself, and to write goals to move forward. This is not an easy process uh, because, you know, if your participant comes with a crisis, the first thing that I want to do is to sort of fix the crisis and help them move forward. But that's not my job. My job is to make sure that I support them and I give them the skills. I coach them with the skills that they need to have to move from that crisis. And of course, as you know, there is crisis to crisis. Sometimes a crisis is, they come with a crisis that, you know, their gas and their electricity is going to be shut down tomorrow. Of course, it's a crisis and you need to work on that with them. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about the crisis that sometimes participants come with and it's not really a crisis. It's not something that needs to be resolved that day. And those are when you really coach them on the necessary skills to think about, okay, uh, first of all, have the conversation, is this really a crisis? What can you do about this? Uh, let's think about writing some goals about this to help you. Um, and then again, through the coaching, you're supporting them and you're helping them to solve uh, the issue. Uh, and again, as I said before, this is not an easy process. It takes time and a lot of coaching using motivational interviewing to be able to help the participant move from crisis management to obtaining goal. Um, uh, so some tips that I can give you when that happens. So the first thing that I'll suggest that you do is to help the participant calm herself because she's not going to be able to focus on goals if she's crying or very upset. Um, what I have done in the past that has been helpful is to ask the participant to do some breathing exercises um, and that will help with calming the participant. Um, other things that work in the past is to give them a pen and paper to write about their feelings, to write about the crisis, and that also helps them calm down um, I'm thinking about what else. Um, setting an agenda is also good because when the part if you have an agenda when the participant comes, you can say, okay, the agenda today is, you know, we're going to fill out some housing applications. Uh, what do you have on the agenda? And then you make sure that what the crisis she's describing is on the agenda. And then she will know that, you know, part of the conversation that day is going to be talking about the crisis that she is having that day. Feel free to ask any questions. Um, this is an example for, for, for the participants that have been working in long-term programs. Um, sometimes this looking at this tools, it is challenging for some participants and it's kind of worry. Um, so what we suggest is that you work with that participant uh, on a pillar. Think about one pillar at a time. 
uh, maybe family stability is one that people pick a lot because it's talking about their kids and that sometimes it's easier than to talk about finances. This is an example of um, brainstorming session with a participant that uh, was in one of our long-term programs. And, and again, these are not smart goals. This is a brainstorming session about a participant who's thinking about you know, buying a home in six years. Uh, what does she need to do uh, to be able to reach that goal? And as you can see, under finances, there was a lot of savings. Uh, there was also increased credit score because she's going to need a high credit score to apply for a loan. Um, this participant also needs to be working on her career, uh, make sure that she is has a good income and she can continue to increase her income. And now uh, Emerald is going to talk a little bit more about goal setting. Yeah, so we've talked about kind of that brainstorming piece, which I think is really um, important. Um, and kind of bring, I'm drawing out those values um, and where a participant wants to go. Um, maybe long term. But then we're thinking, so this is actually one of our, um, our participants, is that if a goal seemed too great of a task, we would figure out ways to break it down into smaller goals, still reaching the same outcome. So I want to highlight that we talk about here goal setting like a GPS. So there's a final destination, which is the goal, but there are multiple ways to make it to that final destination. So right, there's no right, one right way to make it to that, that final kind of, um, of achieving that goal. And that there will likely be roadblocks and detours along the way, but the mentor or coach's role is to provide support um, as participants or families navigate those challenges. Um, so this framework is designed with the intention that over time a family no longer needs a GPS as so they become familiar with the roads um, and anticipate the detours and roadblocks. So individuals and families are also not always given space um, outside of our office or out um, maybe um, receiving other services. They're not always given the space or autonomy to self-direct or prioritize. Um, and goal setting provides an opportunity for this to happen. So even if it's in short-term programming, it's still a space, like I said earlier, to practice those executive functioning skills um, and really build up that self-efficacy and practice navigating, navigating those barriers. Um, and just, we talked, again, kind of broadly about brainstorming, but really in setting those goals, kind of reviewing it. So you've done the bridge um, with the participant, and then you're in the goal setting brainstorming process. And so we saw some of those tools which are available, I believe, on the portal um, in terms of being able to use those, those brainstorming tools that Deanna was um, referencing. Uh, and then pulling out maybe those values with the vision boards, the writing exercises. Um, so that's all kind of part of that, that pre um, of really getting into the nitty gritty of goal setting. Um, and so why is getting into that nitty gritty of goal setting important? Well, it's the primary instrument for maintaining the focus on change. So it represents a contract. Um, so we do it here. We have a goal setting. Um, form that we use here um, that is signed by both participant and mentor. Um, so it kind of serves as that, that contract um, for the mentor and the participant um, and the resolution of obstacles or the acquisition of new skills um, and modification of behavior. Um, and then through this contract, and I put in quotes of kind of, because obviously not binding, but this idea that um, it is important um, and it matters that both people are invested in it. Um, so participants commit to a pathway of change um, and initially, um, the contract, which is based on executive functioning, um, is an external document with set goals. But as clients practice, um, so with the guidance of their mentors in the mobility mentoring framework, techniques and strategies for crisis containment, problem solving, um, priority setting, uh, building of expertise, and attaining increasingly difficult multi-step goals, those develop um, and grow and that sense of capacity for change. Um, and really that they exert that internal control over their lives, and that's a huge part of goal setting. So um, experiencing that sense of accomplishment and really feeling that, that sense of control that can often be, be lost um, in the world when individuals that we work with face many challenges. Um, and so goals, achieving them though, they need to be smart, meaningful, and motivate the participant to become, um, well, we would say economically self-sufficient, or e economically self-sufficient here, but we understand that that's different across programming. Um, and then also that goals need to align with program outcomes. So how do we create those meaningful goals? Um, again, we mentioned earlier exploring what's meaningful to you versus what is meaningful to the participant, what is meaningful to the program. 
um, we talked about ways in which you might learn what is really meaningful to a participant. And then also working on that motivation piece. So the intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, we talk about a lot here. So the intrinsic motivation, the participant's desire, um, how much do I want to do this, and the belief, um, how likely am I going to, or how likely is it that I'm going to succeed. So if a participant's desire is stronger than their belief, you can help identify um, and work on that lack of um, self-efficacy or belief in themselves. If a participant's belief is stronger than their desire, then there's room to work on the goal um, to edit, to adjust, um, in some way to align it with uh, making it kind of that, that realistic piece of, of the SMART goal setting. Um, and that comes with the coaching, coaching piece of it. And then extrinsic motivation is that outside source of incentives or expectations and accountability between you and the participant. And the idea is that over time, um, it might start with extrinsic motivation, but over time goal setting is meant to build up that intrinsic motivation. And the last piece is the momentum. So inspiring, motivation, and momentum. Um, so always reflecting back to participants the strengths, um, encouraging them to dream big. Um, again, some of the questions they might ask are, how would you like things to look for you and your family um, in a year from now, even in a month from now, maybe even next week? Um, playing an important role, you as a mentor, um, and showing the participants positive attributes, um, the goals they previously achieved, and their determination. So at the beginning, that really starts with writing short-term goals and what we call low-hanging fruit. Um, achieving those low-hanging fruit goals so that a participant sees um, that sense of accomplishment and then continuing to point out those small successes and encouraging participants, um, increasing that engagement and building momentum um, for change. And so one helpful um, thing that we talk about sometimes in our training, um, a question you might ask, so again, back to that kind of values and uh, momentum is on a scale of 1 to 10, how important is this goal to you? And if the participant answers something like a 7, you might inquire why the goal isn't a six on the scale. So then the participant is encouraged to think about and communicate um, why this goal is important and why they're continuing to work to achieve it. Um, it also gives you as a mentor and coach a deeper insight into the participant's values. And now, the SMART goals, which I'm sure we've all heard a lot about, um, but we're going to talk a little, go a little deeper um, today because just on its surface we have SMART goals as being specific. So the goal is clear um, that you know what you're working towards or the participant knows what they're working towards um, and then whether there's an idea of whether or not, or it's clear, um, back to kind of whether or not they have it, it accomplished it um, with that idea that it's measurable. So there's a clear way to tell whether the goal has been accomplished. Um, and that's attainable. So the goal can realistically be accomplished given the current situation um, and the work needed to attain the goal. And then it's relevant. So the goal must be really related to progressing um, economically. So that's in our, our programming um, and personally relevant. Um, so it matters. So that, Imagine the participant, they're much more likely to achieve it. And then that time bound. So the goal must include a time when it will be achieved. Um, so I like to note that SMART goals, um, it's really easy, I think, to just make a goal, right? So a goal that's not SMART. Like, we can easily do that for ourselves, with our participants. Um, but it's really hard in thinking about being the participant or the family, or even our own shoes, to actually achieve a goal that is not SMART, right? Because it doesn't give us a lot to work with. And so I like to kind of keep that in mind. It might be easy to set initially a goal that's not SMART, so it's easier to not take um, kind of the, those extra steps to make it SMART, but it's much harder to achieve that goal. So really, over time, it makes more sense to kind of um, put, in, put in that effort and intention right um, at, up front. But I will say that SMART goals take practice because we're not um, really socialized to think in a SMART goal format. Um, and so, again, taking practice, taking the time with one another. We have an exchange member, actually, who workshops kind of SMART goals, like looking at de-identified goals that have been set um, across programs and really working to make them SMART with one another, so kind of that practice piece of it. Um, we also have mentors here that use um, a SMART goal sheet, so it'll say kind of like this on the sheet, um, and then it'll have boxes sort of checked next to each one, and so you can go through and say, okay, is this specific, is this measurable, is this attainable, and go through as you're writing the goal. But then again, you're also working with the participant that's part of the coaching process, and that it's not all on you as a mentor or the coach to, to make it smart, right? It's a um, collaborative process, so working together and practicing that, um, that piece of it. So every time you set a goal, kind of making it a... Um, uh, every time the participant sets a goal with you, they know you're going to go through and you're going to do that checklist. So it becomes kind of habit, habitual. And so eventually, um, when they're no longer working with you, they're still kind of thinking that way. And, and we are too, and I even, and we kind of have a culture of goal setting here too at Empath, and that staff practices it. Um, so I have written um, goal sheets and practice it in making my own because I think it's easier to, to do the work if, if I can myself set those SMART goals. 
Um, all right, and then here it is again. So this is the idea of just um, each piece's underline of what makes it that specific piece of a SMART goal, so specific. Um, submit three applications for subsidized housing by September 1st. So the spe specificity of the three applications for subsidized housing. What makes it measurable? So three applications. So we know that if two applications have been submitted, that that's not necessarily the goal. I mean, that's still actually great work. Um, but this idea that we know that if three applications have not been submitted, um, that this specific goal may not have been achieved. Um, and is it achievable? So is it um, attainable or achievable to submit three applications um, for subsidized housing by September 1st? And again, that's something that you will know working with your family, um, working with your participant, and thinking about, is this achievable? And that's a conversation. Um, and that's part of that openness, that coaching of like understanding, getting to know your participant, where they're at. Um, and then relevance. So in our programming, submitting three applications for subsidized housing by September 1st is relevant to our programming. Um, if this, if you were in a program that did absolutely nothing to do with housing or something, and I don't know, and this was a goal that came up, that might be a conversation of, okay, and this is relevant, maybe it's relevant to the participant and their goals, um, and kind of keeping that in mind of getting your program outcomes as well as the autonomy um, and self-determination of your families and your participants. And that last piece is the time bound. Um, and so that's always, I, I feel like often when we see goals, that's at the end, and that's kind of the last one of, okay, when is this going to be done by? Um, and there's a way to have that conversation again, I think to really put it, you're empowering your participants. So um, I know in kind of the language we use here is, um, and when do you think you can achieve this, or you'll, you'll achieve this by? And so keeping it really a positive, like you're going to achieve this. Um, but then also really making it a, a safe space that if things come up, that's okay too. And it can always be, um, the goals can always be adapted. Uh, but asking questions and kind of that, that positive, um, that positive to, again, put in power um, our participants as we're working on setting the, setting the SMART goals. Now, are there any questions? I know we're kind of going through this, um, but we want to make sure that we're giving some, some information on, on the SMART goals. This last piece that I want to definitely draw attention to is, again, so this idea of the brainstorming. Um, I know we talked we're talking about SMART goals, but this, this brainstorming piece is really important. And it's also really important to note that as mentors, as coaches, as case managers, and family advocates, um, you as a professional, as a person, have a lot of expertise. Um, and you bring that to your work, and that's important. Um, so yes, we're working with, we're partnering with participants, we're empowering them, we're, you know, we're trying to really build up that self-efficacy. But you know, if one of your for instance, this is um, in our programming, again, kind of um, over a year period moving into affordable housing, which is one of our, um, prim our primary goal in short-term programming here at Empath. But as a mentor, I know that this, this is likely the trajectory of that goal. Um, and so I bring that to, to the relationship. And so I can use that in, in setting those goals. So I know that um, if my participant were to tell me that that is their goal, that I likely know this is how it's going to look. But from here, I create actions, or we create action steps together with the, with the participant um, from, from this larger goal. Here you can break it down. This is the trajectory. Um, this is likely where action steps are going to come, but it's really individual based. Um, so you're bringing in kind of your participant's um, history and challenges and strengths. And, and you're bringing into that, but you're also bringing your knowledge of what of what that trajectory looks like. And I think um, that can be really important. I know Deanna has mentioned that um, she has a resource that she uses of having goals that might be set in the various pillars um, that likely come up that are common goals that are set in each pillar. And having that as a resource or a tool, um, so you likely you see many of the same goals um, come up in your programming and having that as a resource of, okay, what are some of the common goals that are set in each pillar? Um, and then likely, what are maybe some of the action steps? So I think having that as a resource um, for staff members and really brainstorming that um, with one another um, can be really helpful because, again, thinking on your feet quickly about setting SMART goals and like, likely if your family is in crisis, like setting those SMART goals and thinking about that all at once is really challenging. So I think as much as like having those resources for one another um, and workshopping that can, can be very, very helpful. And I'm gonna pass over this last, last piece of Diana again. We are happy to answer any questions, um, but we will continue to, to move on if nothing comes up. <laughs> it's not. um, okay, some tips uh, for goal setting. It's really important from the beginning that you explain to your participants why are we writing goals and why it's so important that there is that there are smart goals and how all that is aligned with the bridge of 
with the bridge and also how that is aligned with the program outcome and how all is interacting together. Also, it's really important that uh, the participant check her goals to make that they are smart. Uh, we give to the participants that why let me show you um, this one. So at every meeting we bring this and we give it to the participant so when she writes the goals she checks to make sure that her goal is smart and we do that a lot at the beginning but after a few meetings then the participant uh, you know no and doesn't need the, the reminder anymore. But at the beginning, it's really important that you bring all those tools so the participant can see how to use them. And sometimes, as I said before, it is really challenging for a participant to pick um, a pillar because sometimes looking at all the five pillars could be challenging. Um, so just helping the participant to pick something or to pick the one that um, she needs more help with, maybe it's child care, maybe it's housing. Um, so sort of help the, tell the participant with that. Um, we talk about, Emma talk about the low-hanging fruit goals, which are short-term goals, and I start with those because that will motivate the participant to keep going. Once he reaches that small goal, he's going to be more motivated and you have take advantage of that to keep the momentum and to keep them engaged. And what happens is that over time, uh, participants will fill out their own goal sheet. This is the one that we use at MPAS, and the participants will fill out that. Um, what I like to do is from the beginning, I ask the participants to start filling out their own goal plans. Uh, other mentors wait a few months to ask the participants to start writing their own goals. It is up to you what's the preference. Uh, I have one participant that told me that she did not feel comfortable writing the goals, so I have to do it all the time for her, and that's okay. Um, but ideally, uh, you want to coach your participant to start writing their own goals, because what you want to do is to make sure that she gets all this training, if you will, uh, so then she can write goals even though she might not be in your program, she might not be working with you, but she can start writing her own goals in the future. Uh, quickly, goals uh, about incentives. So to know our programs have monetary incentives and our programs don't have them, so um, we challenge ourselves to be creative and using other incentives uh, to reward the participants. And it could be just a, a card that says congratulations. We use that a lot. We get um, cards that say good job, congratulations, and we give that to our participants. And we also ask them, you know, how do you want to reward yourself for reaching this goal? One participant told me that she was just going to take 10 minutes after, she, after they keep her sleeping uh, she takes 10 minutes to drink a cup of tea, and that's the reward for her when she writes, when she reaches her goals. So again, to sort of help the participants think about ways that she can celebrate her accomplishment. Um, it is, it is um, really good to have all the support. You have your bridge, you have your goal setting forms. Um, participants also, we give them uh, calendars for the year so they can, they can keep track of appointments for the ones that are in a school, they can keep track of that. We also have the tip sheets that are one-page resources about different topics. Um, and what I wanted to tell you more about this is the importance of following up uh, because is it's really important that you keep in contact with them, even though you might see them every three months. If you can, you know, maybe send an email or a text or a quick phone call once a month. I don't know 
if you can do that um, because of your timing, but if you can, it, it, it's great that you keep in contact with them, um, even if it's just one text per month. Um, so it is important that you send the resources you said that you're going to send, make sure that you follow through in a timely manner because accountability goes both ways. And just to finish our presentation today, as good coaches and mentors, we also need to take care of ourselves. When we experience high levels of stress, we are less effective at what we do. Uh, remember, self-care is not an emergency plan. You need to work on it every day. This might mean blocking off time on your calendar specifically to recharge or to have lunch sometimes. Um, Self-care is different for everyone. So what might be good for me might not be good for you. So it's really important that you know what's best for you and that you find ways of taking care of yourself. So the challenge that we have for you today is to look at the self-care wheel and pick one new thing that you are going to do in each of the six areas of the wheel. And remember, when you pick one of those, write, write, write them as the smart goals for yourself. Um, right. So we have a few more minutes. Um, if there are any questions, um, happy to answer them now. If any of this needs to marinate um, or questions come up later on, we're also happy to answer them then. Um, this is Gary. <laughs> Oh, sorry, Carrie. Okay. I was just going to say real quick for people, if they, they can either answer in the question box or if they raise their hand, then I can unmute them and they can ask their question voice to voice. Oh, great. So I just had a quick question about the tip sheets that you um, use. Are those on the exchange right now? Um, we, I think some of them may be about um, like running credit reports and things like that, um, but we're working on, we have a few like, uh, for instance, applying for FAFSA and things like that that we're working on getting um, branded and up there. So I guess I, uh, the other thing I heard um, you guys say was that you have, um, do you have some forms or something that you already have some common pre-written out SMART goals? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I created a list of SMART goals on the five pillars of the bridge for one of our programs, and we'll be happy to send those to you. Right. Yeah. I would love to see an example of that. Yeah, we can definitely do that. Yeah, and this is Karen. It would also be nice to check in with Jennifer and see if she is okay with sending some examples of the tip sheets as well. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I can, I can also do, let me make a note of that, yeah. Looks like we do have a question. A question from Estelle is, do you have the SMART goals sheet in Spanish? We need it. Oh, the, um, the goal action plan? No. Oh, or the one that we were just talking about? Oh, I realize, oh, she's probably typing. Um. Both. Oh, both. We have a goal action form in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Could you translate your... Sure, I can translate that. Um, and then Deanna says she could also translate the the other SMART goal sheet. So this is Karen, and I think that our forms are a little bit different, what we've created in Washington State. And so, Estella, if those are things that you need us to have translated for you, then um, we can work to have those translated. And it would think. be great to get samples. It would also be great to get samples of what you're using as well, just, you know, to for people to see yeah. how different people are approaching writing SMART goals and setting goals with families. Yes. We can definitely do that. Yeah, it would be, um, Carrie, or who would be the best person to send these things to? You can send them to me. Okay, great.
Right. We, it looks like we have another question from Estelle. Um, she says, uh, is it a problem if a family sets a goal like an education but does not move them on the bridge? But oh, it does not move them on the bridge. Yeah, that's a great question. So the way that we track outcomes here at Empath um, is movement on the bridge, so up the pillars, but we also um, track outcomes for goals set and achieved in each pillar because some goals take a long time to achieve, um, and so they might not necessarily have moved up a, a rung of the bridge, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't wonderful work and movement just in that participant's life. So we, we track those outcomes, um, and so I would say that's absolutely okay and also definitely um, to be expected. Um, I do just want to also make a plug while we're here that we'll be doing another webinar um, for the entire exchange on Wednesday. Um, so Wednesday from 3 to 4 Eastern Standard Time, so that would be 12, 12, um, your time, on our new um, tool. That's our, it's called our Career Compass. It's an online uh, career exploration tool that might be also helpful um, when you're working on goal setting with your participants and thinking about careers um, and kind of trajectory of, of pay and salary and interests and things like that. So um, if anyone's interested, I would um, definitely invite you to tune in on Wednesday if you're available. Well, I, um, if there are, I'm, I'm sort of being aware to make sure I'm giving people a, a chance to type or raise their hand if they um, have a question, but I don't see any coming in. Oh, looks like, like we have one that just came, came in from uh, Chantal. She asked, is there a printable version of this PowerPoint? Oh. Um, I believe, um, Carrie, you, I think you have the slides, right, on, I think Deanna sent them to you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So yeah, I can, I, I mean, if, if you're okay with sharing with what um, you shared today. Yeah, let me double check, because um, I know we have okay. some branding uh, yeah. rules on that. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe we can just like PDF and brand and then, uh, but I'll, I'll check with Jen and let you know on that one. Okay. Yep. Well, it doesn't look like anyone else has got questions for us. Um, if in the meantime, uh, if you belong to Basecamp, that's a great place to um, post some questions. If you don't know what Basecamp is and you want to know more about it, you can email me uh, at Carrie, K E R R Y dot Beamer, B E Y M E R, at D E L dot Law dot Gov, and I can get you um, um, some information about that. All right, guys, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom on SMART goals and uh, sort of breaking them down into actionable steps. That was really helpful. I hope you all out there today um, found that useful. And we'll, we'll see about um, sharing the uh, resources we shared today um, with you all when we get those. Yes, no, thank you so much for having us. Um, we really enjoyed it. And also, um, there are lots of resources and tools on the online exchange portal. So if anyone does not have access to the portal, um, please email me. Um, my email's on there, but it's uh, ecronin at empathways.org, um, and I can get you set up with online exchange portal access because you all um, have access to that. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today, and I hope that you have a lovely rest of your afternoon.